Welcome to the 2020-2021 school year. My name is Brad Jadarski and I'm the Oshkosh West Activities Coordinator. I want to welcome you to our online athletic code meeting for this school year. I'm going to ask that you please follow along in your goldenrod colored Oshkosh Area School District co-curricular handbook as I will be referencing many of the materials found within the handbook. Please be advised, I will be covering the items I feel are most important, but as a student athlete and parent, you are responsible for all of the material found within the handbook, and if you ever have a question at any time regarding anything found in the co-curricular handbook, please feel free to contact me. Students, I'm located in, um, near the main office in the E-Wing. Parents, on the front of the handbook is my email address and office phone number. Keep in mind, competing in athletics is a privilege, not a right. You are a student athlete, first and foremost, and academics come first. Meaning if you don't do the job in the classroom, you won't be able to do the job out on the athletic field. The Oshkosh West Athletic Department has a vision statement. It is to educate, inspire, and shape the next generation of leaders through commitment, competition, and service to the team, our school, and our community. We also, also have a number of core values. Those five core values are one, do the right thing, integrity and honesty in thoughts, actions, and words. Two, strive for greatness, excellence in academics, athletics, and character. Three, lead with the purpose, selfless commitment to team goals. Four, promote the Wildcat culture, pride in self, team, and school. And five, raise the bar, inspire others to be their best. Please note that all of our decision-making as an athletic department is based around our vision statement and our core values. In order to complement our core values, we have a Wildcat Creed. That creed is found in the back of the co-curricular handbook, the last white page. The creed is found on the inside cover. We ask our student athletes to live and breathe this creed 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. We challenge you to be an 11, which is doing the right thing all of the time. Leading with the purpose as a student athlete, set the example for your peers. Promote the wildcat cat culture. Show your wildcat pride. Also as a student athlete, all of our athletic programs have agreed to follow a common weight training program. This is a program tailored to meet the individual needs of each and every program while also instilling a set of core lifts to help any student athlete be a better student athlete in whatever sport they participate in. We believe our weight training purpose falls in line with striving for greatness by doing year-round efforts, raising the bar, encouraging others to do the same, and leading with the purpose by setting the example. No matter what sport you participate in at Oshkosh West High School, your coaches will reference our vision statement, core values, our Wildcat Creed, our challenging of you to be an 11, and also having a common weight training expectation. We're very fortunate at Oshkosh West High School to have Ascension Sports Medicine provide our athletic training services. We are extremely blessed and fortunate to have three outstanding athletic trainers at Oshkosh West High School. Tyler Van Sistine, Dan Gary, and Travis Herring. On this slide, you will find their email address and cell phone numbers. They are here to help keep you safe and perform at your peak potential. So parents or student athletes, if you ever have a question or concern regarding athletic training, please contact the trainer assigned to your sport or any one of the trainers there to help provide you with additional resources. The next few slides are going to talk about some athletic training information that's very important for you to know as a member of the Wildcat Athletic Program. As I mentioned, we have three licensed athletic trainers. They'll be available after school hours and at many sports uh, providing athletic training coverage. The athletic training room hours are daily when we have school from 3 to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday. 
They will occasionally be in on Saturdays and or Sundays if requested by the coach for practices. Licensed athletic trainers, or LATs, practice under the direction and in collaboration with physicians and other healthcare professionals. They evaluate, treat injuries, and provide rehab to the injured. They provide immediate care in the event of a game injury, and as needed, they will provide physician referral if necessary and will communicate with the parents and coaching staff about this process. They also deal with concussions. A concussion is a brain injury and all concussions are serious. Concussions can be serious injuries with fatal consequences if not evaluated and treated properly. All concussions require an assessment and individualized treatment recommendations. Concussions can occur in any sport. They can be caused by a direct blow to the head or an injury to the body resulting in an indirect force to the head. Any suspected concussion should be referred to the licensed athletic trainers. Concussions are a traumatic brain injury that impairs the brain's ability to carry out normal functions. There are many varied symptoms that can describe a concussion and not all are visible. Some include headaches, dizziness, confusion, nausea, light and sound sensitivity, difficulty concentrating, memory loss, feeling slowed down and personality changes can all be indicators of a possible head injury. The LATs will perform preseason impact concussion testing to get a baseline of the athlete's neurological functions. All freshmen and juniors will be impact tested and anyone who didn't take the test last year or is new to the school will be tested as well. There is a impact testing permission form that you will need to fill out and sign if you fall into one of those categories. Should the athlete sustain a suspected concussion, the pre-evaluation can be utilized by a physician to help determine the proper course of treatment for return to play. Only contact sports are tested. Any non-contact sport athlete may be tested upon request of the LATs. Non-impact sports are swimming, cross-country, tennis, track, and golf. Parents and coaching staff will be contacted in the case of a suspected concussion. Parents will be directly notified and an informational sheet will be sent home. Athletes should be seen as soon as possible by the athletic trainer, then referred to a physician for further evaluation. All athletes will be kept out of all practices and activities while presenting any symptoms. They will see the LATs daily to track these symptoms. When the athlete is asymptomatic, the parents will need a physician's clearance for the return to practice or play. Once cleared by the physician, the LATs will run the athlete through a gradual return to play protocol. This process involves reintroduction, reintroduction of a simple cardio, progressing to longer durations of cardio, to strength training, to limited practice conditions, a full practice, and then full return to practice and play status. Coaches are instructed to follow to use the following procedure when student athletes with student athletes and concussions. When in doubt, they sit the athlete out. Parents and athletes are required to turn in a signed concussion information sheet once per school year before they can practice in any sport. Ascension also has two new handouts in your athletic training packet. It'd be page three and four that we are requesting parent student signatures and signing off on those concussion documents as well before a student begins to practice. Additional information on concussions can be found at the WIA website below. Please note the WIA also provides concussion insurance for all member schools. This insurance is secondary to a family's primary insurance. Information about this insurance is available from the athletic trainer. Basically, this coverage will pick up any costs not covered by your primary insurance related to a concussion injury. Pre-existing medical conditions. It is very important the LATs and coaching staff are notified by the parents and athletes about any prior or current health conditions. Examples would be diabetes, asthma, allergy and allergic reactions, heart conditions, or any conditions that could impact the athlete's personal safety during play. 
If an athlete carries an inhaler or an EpiPen, make sure the coaching staff and teammates are made aware of this and where to find it in case of an emergency. Athletes should consume at least 16 to 20 ounces of water two hours before practice and at least eight ounces in the 15 minutes prior to practice beginning. Proper hydration is critical. Athletes should regularly consume water during breaks in practice, even if they do not feel thirsty. Feeling thirsty is not a proper measure of hydration. 48 ounces or roughly two normal bottles of water can be taken in during the course of an hour of strenuous practice. After practice, for every pound of water lost, athletes need to ingest 16 to 20 ounces of water. That is one bottle of water for every pound lost. This does not include the normal six to eight bottles of water a person should also drink normally throughout the day. Other important health information is in regards to physicals. Student athletes are required to have a valid physical on file with the school prior to being, being cleared to practice in any sport. Physicals dated April 1 of 2019 or more current are valid for the 2020-2021 school year. An additional option is available for some students who can't get in to see their primary care physician. In that particular case, please contact the activities coordinator for more information as if we have a physical on file with the school from April 1 of 2018 to March 31st of 2019, we do have a form available for you to fill out that may waive your need to get a new physical if you are unable to get in to see your primary care provider due to COVID for the 2020-2021 school year. There's also a WIAA banned substance list that's found in the appendix in the co-curricular handbook, which is in the back of the handbook. I will be covering that information a little bit later in this presentation. So at this time, I'm going to ask you to open up your co-curricular handbook. You'll find on page three the table of contents, which has a lot of very helpful information um, in order to find a specific section very clearly. On page four, we have the different categories of activities sponsored by the Oshkosh Area School District. Athletics are under category A, which also includes dance. On page five, you'll see in the center of the page the website address for the WIAA, which is our state governing body, at www.wiaawi.org. You can go to that website to find all of the information available from the state office regarding the many aspects of being eligible to participate in a high school athletic program. If you ever have a question about anything found at the WIA website, please contact Mr. Jadarski for additional information. On pages five and six, you'll find the items needed in order to be cleared as a student athlete to start practice in any of our athletic programs. Please note, you are not able to start practice in any sport until all of these items are taken care of. One, a physical form or an alternate year form. Basically, we have to have a valid physical on file at school. It needs to be dated, like I said, April 1 of 2019 or more current, unless we already have one on file at the school during that April 1 of 2018 to March 31st, 2019 time period. We also may need an alternate year form. This is a parent permission form, depending on how old your physical is. Basically, it's the second school year of a physical. A physical can be good for two school years depending on the date of the exam. That would need to be April 1 of 2000, April 1st of a given school year or later to be eligible or valid for two or more or for two school years. So again, an alternate year card will be required if your child's last physical was dated April 1 of 2019 to March 31st of 2020. Then we, will need, then we will need a completed alternate year card. We will need a signed agreement of parent and athlete form and insurance waiver form, which is available online and can be picked up 
from the activities coordinator's office. Payment of the athletic fee is needed if applicable. Again, if you participate in the district's free or reduced meals program, on the bottom of the agreement in parent and athlete form, there is a box you can check that will provide food service permission to share information about your involvement in the free and reduced meals program. If that box is not checked, food service will not provide us that information. An athletic emergency form, again, this is found on the back of the agreement of parent and athlete form. We request some medical information and contact information. That information, both front and back, on the agreement of parent and athlete form must be completed in full. Your child will also bring home a pink emergency card after their season starts from their coach. We ask that you fill out that information on that pink card, return it to your coach as soon as possible as the coaches carry those pink cards with them at all times in the event your child would need emergency treatment. We will need a copy of the signed concussion acknowledgement form. This is a state law. We provide you with a packet of concussion information. On top is the signed concussion acknowledgement form. The additional two pages are concussion informational sheets for parents and student athletes. We will need you to return the signed top form, signed and dated by both the parent and student athlete. You would then keep the rest of the information in the concussion packet. New this year is the COVID waiver form. Every student athlete will need to sign a COVID waiver form prior to beginning practice or participation in any athletic program. On the form on the top, it says activities. We ask that you list every activity your child may participate in during the 2020-2021 school year. As failure to list more than one, will require you in filling out a new form for each sport your child participated, participates in this school year if you don't list them all on top of the form. A student athlete will also be required to view the online athletic code meeting, which is this process, prior to being able, cleared to practice. Once done viewing this video, there will be a fillable form the student has to fill out all of the information requested and then push the submit button to be cleared for this requirement. One additional requirement is the Ascension Sports Information Packet. The second and third pages, or the, excuse me, the third page on front to back has a parent and student signature and um, initialing area on each form. That information needs to be filled out and form signed and dated and turn into the activities coordinator in order to begin to practice as well. All this information is needed prior to your child being cleared to practice in any sport. Also some new things for the 2020-2021 school year. Many of these things will be in place for fall sports and possibly in place for the winter and spring seasons depending on how things proceed with the COVID case and pandemic facing our country. Athletes will have daily health screenings prior to being allowed to participate in practice or competitions. Those screenings will be done either by the coach and or athletic trainer. Students will be asked to fill out a questionnaire which can be done on their phone and or they'll answer specific questions to a coach or trainer and they will also have their temperature taken each and every day before practice and or competition. As an athletic department we are having in the fall conference only schedules for competition that may or may not continue in the winter and spring seasons. And finally there will be a number of locker room changes in place for this school year meaning we will have staggered start times and end times to practices so as to minimize the amount of student athletes in the locker room at one time. Also, students' lockers will be spaced so that we can provide social distancing between athletes when they're in there changing. And if students decide to utilize our shower facilities, we will be um, blocking off each and every other shower for use in order to limit the amount of students in the shower area and to properly social distance. 
We appreciate all of your flexibility and understanding during these challenging times as our goal is to provide a safe experience for your child and ideally to be able to provide the experience to practice and compete this school year. On pages seven and eight of the Cole Curricular Handbook is information regarding the district's athletic fee. The school board approved the following fees for the 2020-21 school year in athletics, a $50 fee per sport, a $100 individual limit per school year, with a $175 family limit per school year at the high school level. Fees should be paid at the school bank or online, and refunds are issued at one predetermined time. Information found on refunds. Or information on refunds can be found on page 8 under High School Collection section of the Co-Curricular Handbook. On pages 8 to 10 of the Co-Curricular Handbook is information regarding academic requirements. Please note, a full-time student is a student with a member school is responsible for programming 100% of the student's day. The student is eligible for like or similar awards, privileges, and services as all other students and meets all obligations and responsibilities as other students without exception. So in order to compete in athletics at Oshkosh West, a student must meet school and DPI requirements defining a full-time student and have received no failing grades, including incompletes, in the most recent grade reporting period. Oshkosh West uses the second grade reporting period of first semester, first semester, the second grade reporting period of second semester, and second semester grades. Note, for the 2021 school year, the Oshkosh Area School District will defer academic eligibility requirements for all students until the second grade reporting period of first semester, meaning any student participating in a fall sport or activity will start the year academically eligible no matter what their previous grades were second semester of last school year. This will just be for fall sports and activities and we will do our first academic grade check at the second grade reporting period of first semester. Regarding academic ineligibility on page 9, 3A, should a student become academically ineligible with one failing grade, he or she may not participate in competitions or performances for a minimum of seven consecutive school days and nights while the activity is in session. The student may return to competition or performance on the A school day, provided the student received at least a 2.5 grade point average in the most recent grade reporting period. If the student had a grade point average of less than 2.5 in the most recent grade reporting period, he or she may come to the activities coordinator's office to secure an academic eligibility form. This form will list the student's current class load. The student must take the form to his or her teachers for completion and return it to the activities coordinator's office each and every week. To regain eligibility, the student must be passing in all courses each and every week, meaning if a student is failing even one class, they are not academically eligible. This must continue each and every week until the next grade reporting period. Should a student become academically ineligible with more than one failing grade, he or she may not participate in athletic competition or performances for a minimum of 15 consecutive school days and nights while the activity is in session. The student may return to competition or performance on the 16th school day, provided the student is passing all of their classes. To regain eligibility, the student must follow the academic eligibility form process, meaning taking their, their form to each and every teacher and having them sign the form each and every week. The student must be passing every class every week to be academically eligible. Note the student could be eligible one week and then ineligible the next or vice versa. On page 10, students who received one failing grade 
and who had less than a 2.5 grade point average in the most recent grade reporting period, or students who received more than one failing grade for the most recent grade reporting period, will have a chance to regain academic eligibility at the five or 15 week grade reporting period. These students will have their grades checked at these grade reporting periods and if the student has no failing grades, they will no longer be considered academically ineligible. The moral of the story is do the job in the classroom first and foremost or you won't be able to participate out on the athletic field. And again, even though all fall students are getting a free pass to start the 2021 school year, please remember to start your 2021 school year academically strong once school starts, meaning do your homework, complete your exams, and put forth the effort. On pages 10 and 11 are some other areas I want to specifically reference. The first is number four in regards to illness. A student must be present at all classes on the day of a practice or competition to be eligible to participate. Only permission from school administration or the activities coordinator will permit a student to compete after missing classes. Such examples of excused reasons would be attendance at a funeral, a doctor, a dentist or other medical health care provider appointment, an absence that is related to a classroom grade such as a field trip or the like. Students may not participate in any competition or performance or practice if they are out ill for any or all of the school day without permission from school administration or the activities coordinator. Many times students may not feel well in the morning and call if they call our office and let us know what's going on, we may provide permission for them to, to participate later in the day if they get to school for the second half of the day. However, if a student does not call ahead of time, Permission more than likely will not be provided. Also, if a student goes home not feeling well at the end of the day, they will not be allowed to practice or compete that particular evening. If a student misses school on a Friday due to being ill, typically it will be a coach-parent decision about whether or not the student athlete can participate on a Saturday event. And please note the district will have additional policies and procedures in place regarding illness due to the COVID pandemic and all of those policies and procedures will, will supersede anything in regards to this particular cont content area of the co-curricular handbook. Out-of-town travel. Number six, a student who travels to an out-of-town contest with the school team or activity must return with the team or activity. The only exception to this rule is if a student's parent is present at the out-of-town site. He or she may request that the student returns with the parent. The request must be made in person by the parent to the coach or advisor in charge, and the parent will have to also sign off on a form that they are taking their child. Each coach will have a copy of the district transportation form with them for all away events. It is important to note, however, that the coach advisor has the option whether or not to grant permission to take the child. Please note, it is parent or legal guardian only and your child only, not the neighbor. A grandma or grandpa cannot pick up the child. An older sibling cannot. It must be the parent and or legal guardian can only pick up their child and their child only. Regarding vacations on page 10, at the discretion of, of each coach or advisor when a student is absent due to being on vacation with his or her family, Upon returning to the team or activity, that student will not be allowed to participate in competitions or performances equal to one half of the competition or performances that student missed. If the student is absent due to being on vacation with someone other than his or her family, the student will not be allowed to participate in whatever number of competitions or performances were missed. One competition or performance for each competition performance missed. Please note, if a student misses only practices but not competition due to being on vacation with either family or friends, this still may impact playing time for the student upon his or her return. Students and parents are encouraged to speak with their coach or advisor as soon as possible if they will miss any part of their season. And realize, even if you don't miss competitions, there will more than likely be some missed time upon returning because other students were there working with the team preparing for their next opponent. 
The key is talk to your coach early ahead of time as soon as you know you're going to miss. Other items of topics on pages 12 to 14 include on page 12, number 14, in district transportation. Note the district does not provide transportation for, for students to any practice sites and some home competition or performance sites. In these situations, it is the responsibility of the student, parents, and or legal guardians to provide their own transportation. Please note the school district does not condone students transporting other students to practices or competitions. Use of cameras and other recording devices in locker rooms on page 12 and continuing on to 13. No images of a nude or partially nude person in the locker room may be captured, recorded, or transferred under any circumstances by any individuals. On page 14, club athletic programs, number 16. The district understands that students may want to participate in club athletic programs during the school year during their high school sports season. As a result, the athletic departments would like to provide some guidance for parents and athletes concerning this issue due to the financial commitment associated with club athletic programs. The athletic departments have adopted the following policy for students and parents concerning club athletic programs during a student's high school sports season. For varsity athletes, if a student is on a varsity high school team, the head coach will determine whether or not students will be allowed to practice or participate in a club athletic program during their varsity high school season. If a coach's position is no club participation during the varsity high school season, it is based on the premise that a student's loyalty and allegiance should be to the high school team. For non-varsity athletes, if a student is on a JV or freshman high school team, students will be allowed to participate in club athletic programs during their JV or freshman high school season with the following stipulations. One, the student and parents need to inform the coach about their intentions as soon as possible. And two, students will not be allowed to miss a high school scheduled practice or competition for a club practice or competition. The key here is to work and communicate with your coach as soon as possible if you know club sports participation will become a problem during your high school sports season. The WIA also has a non-school competition rule on page 14. It is the philosophy of the WIAA that a student owes loyalty and allegiance to the school and team of which he or she is a member during the season of a given sport. Athletes may compete in not more than two non-school competitions with school approval during each regular sports season. Keep in mind, School approval is required before participating. The contest will not count against the individual maximum for the athlete in that sport. Non-school competition will not be allowed during the respective WIAA tournament series in a sport. A student becomes ineligible in a sport for the remainder of the season for not receiving school approval beforehand and or competing in more than two non-school games, meets, or contests in the same sport during the season of practice and competition established by the school. Please note, it is same sport, meaning if you're a volleyball player, you cannot participate in more than two volleyball events during the volleyball season if you've been given approval by the coach and school prior to participating in the non-school programs. Remember, Communicating with your coach and the activities coordinator ahead of time, making sure you're doing everything you can to get permission and seeing if it's even going to be provided by this coach and school. On pages 14 to 16 are some basic categories of behavior or conduct expected of student athletes that are participating in our athletic programs. Please note, in all situations involving possible violations of the Code of Conduct, administrative discretion will determine whether or not there is an actual violation of the Code of Conduct. 
A student must refrain from any conduct at any time that would reflect unfavorably on himself, herself, or the school. Contact, conduct which would reflect unfavorably on a student or on the school includes but is not limited to the following. Please be aware of particularly items A, B, C, F, I, N, P, Q, R, and S. But be aware of all of them. A. Use, possession, buying, or selling of controlled substances, street drugs, illegal drugs, and or performance-enhancing substances. Drug paraphernalia including sale, possession, or use. In situations where controlled substances, street drugs, illegal drugs, performance-enhancing substances, and or drug paraphernalia are found at a student's home, property, or personal property, including car, boat, camp, or campsite, etc., the district's position will be that the student was in possession of the controlled substances, street drugs, illegal drugs, performance-enhancing substances, and or drug paraphernalia. The burden of proof will be on the student to convince school administration that he or she did not know the controlled substances, street drugs, illegal drugs, performance-enhancing substances, and or drug paraphernalia were present. B. Use, possession, or purchase of alcoholic beverages. In situation where alcohol is found at a student's home, property, or personal property, car, boat, camp, or campsite, etc., the district's position will be that the student was in possession of the alcohol. The burden of proof will be on the student to convince school administration that he or she did not know the alcohol was present. C. Use, possession, or purchase of tobacco in any form. Use of tobacco means to chew or possess any substance containing tobacco, including smokeless tobacco, in the mouth to derive the effects of tobacco, as well as all uses of tobacco, including cigars, cigarettes, pipe tobacco, chewing tobacco snuff, any other matter or substance that contains tobacco, in addition to papers used to roll cigarettes and or smoking of electronic, vapor, or other substitute forms of cigarettes, clove cigarettes, and any other lighted smoking devices for burning tobacco or any other substance. In situation where tobacco is found at a student's home, property, or personal property, car, boat, camp, or campsite, etc., the district's position will be that the student was in possession of the tobacco. The burden of proof will be on the student to convince school administration that he or she did not know the tobacco was present. Letter F. Criminal offense or a violation of a state statute or city county ordinance having a statutory counterpart, not to include such violations as traffic, jaywalking, or other similar minor citations. Letter I, knowingly, now I'm on page 16, in the presence of alcohol, illegal drugs, and or drug paraphernalia, in situations where it is noticeably apparent to law enforcement officials that alcohol, illegal drugs, and or drug paraphernalia are present, the district's determination will be that the student was knowingly in the presence of alcohol, illegal drugs, and or drug paraphernalia. Students may be present at an establishment, which is primarily for eating, and may be present at a ceremony type activity, such as a wedding reception. Students may only be present at a bar or tavern if they are with their parents. Letter N. Behavior or conduct which reflects unfavorably on a student. Can be a very broad statement, but could include situations where a student is receiving an in-school or out-of-school suspension. Or is the student involved in a behavior that is potentially a violation of the law. In either of those cases, a student could be found in violation of behavior or conduct which reflects unfavorably on a student. Letter P, illegal or inappropriate use of the internet and or electronic devices, any posting or communication via social networking websites which disrupts either the educational or athletic environment is unacceptable. This includes, but is not limited to, the consumption of alcohol, or the use of illicit drugs or facsimiles, inappropriate sexually oriented material, or activities involving bullying, hazing, or harassment, social media posts, Instagram, Snapchat, um, text messages, all of those types of communications, pictures. If, they're, if they end up on the desk of a school administrator, a student can be held accountable for that content and could be found in violation of the district's co-curricular code of conduct. Letter Q, something brand new this year, physical violence or threatening violence against another individual, the school, 
another entity or organization is now have it has a specific category for being a violation of the district's co-curricular handbook. Letter R, hosting a party. Any person who has a gathering at his or her home, property or personal property, such as a car, boat, camper, campsite, etc., where alcohol, tobacco, drugs, or drug paraphernalia are permitted by such person to be used and or brought into the home, property, or personal property, may be given a penalty at a higher level. Administration discretion will determine the length of penalty. So hosting a party or permitting a party to be hosted can result in a significantly higher code of conduct suspension. Letter S, supplying, bringing alcohol drugs. Any person who brings supplies, alcohol, tobacco, drugs, or drug paraphernalia to another person or persons may be given a penalty at a higher level. Administrative discretion will determine the length of the penalty. In the event another individual engages in this behavior on behalf of the athlete, there will be a presumption that the other individual acted as an agent of the athlete and the athlete will receive the same, receive the same punishment as if the athlete had been the supplier. Meaning if you ask your brother or sister or another adult to supply alcohol or drugs for you, you can be suspended for this area of supplying, bringing alcohol drugs. Again, being found in violation of that area can result in a higher code of conduct suspension. Keep in mind that as a student athlete, you have many choices. We encourage you to make good choices. You only get four years of high school, so please make the most of them. You have to ask yourself, is staying at that party, is going to hang out with friends that night, and knowing they may participate in activities that are violations of the athletic code, is it going to be worth it? Okay. I always say, as a student athlete, you probably have a phone. It could either help you get out of trouble, or it could hurt you by getting you in trouble. So if you find yourself in a jam at some particular time during the school year, use that phone to call a parent. Use that phone to send a text message to have somebody get you out of that area. I can't tell you how long it's okay to stay at somebody's house when you notice that alcohol or tobacco maybe or other illegal drugs are there. The best advice I can give you is that the minute you know they're there, leave, call somebody, text somebody to come pick you up. And if that happens... Don't be afraid to tell us what happened. Come into our office. Tell us what happened. Show us that phone call you made. Show us that text message you sent that said, hey, I knew this was going on, and when I found out, I wanted to leave. It will be easier for us as a school to believe you when something like that happens than if we call you down to ask you why you were there regarding what happened. Please note on page 17, our complaint process. Note, complaints or referrals concerning a code violation shall be made in writing and signed by the complainant and or by a law enforcement report and or by a published written account and or by other factual credible means to the activities coordinator. School administration will consider statements made by students to law enforcement officials which are verbally shared with school administration and or are found in a written law enforcement report as factual and truthful statements. If a student upon questioning by a school official recants on such statements made to a law enforcement official, the district's position will be that the statements made to the law enforcement official were truthful and as such it will be up to the student to convince school administration otherwise. Any student in this situation who makes a statement to a law enforcement official which is determined to violate the district's code of conduct, will be ineligible for competition until otherwise determined eligible by school administration. On pages 17 to 26 are really the nuts and bolts of the district's code of conduct. I'm going to go through a number of different areas that I feel are extremely important to be aware of, but make sure that you know what's in this handbook now don't find out what's in the handbook after you've been in a jam. Know what's in the handbook beforehand to keep yourself out of getting in a jam. As I mentioned before on page 17, participation in high school co-curricular activities is a privilege. 
not a right. Failure to abide by established training rules will result in withdrawal of the, of the privilege to participate. Code of conduct violations are cumulative during a student's high school career unless otherwise stated. Note, the district's co-curricular code of conduct is in effect 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. In addition to the penalty provisions set forth below, code of conduct violations may adversely affect school and or conference awards. When a violation occurs, the suspension will be served in a WIA sport in which the student participated in last year or the next WIA sport in which the student participates. A student who participates in a WIA sport and receives a code of conduct or behavioral offense must serve the suspension in a WIAA sport. On the top of page 18, also a student may not join a sport to serve a suspension after the first scheduled contest in that sport has taken place. Also, when any suspension results in a fraction of a game, the number shall be rounded up to the next whole number of games and or contests. Everything is rounded up. Please note our simultaneous consequences. Students may participate in simultaneous activities. However, if a student incurs a violation, he or she shall be penalized according to the code activity if any or all activity seasons are taking place simultaneously. So the first sections I'm going to talk about are violations of the code of conduct without a self-referral. Note, on pages 18 and 19 and 20, for items number 1 through 9, penalties for a first violation are suspension for 25% of the regular season or the equivalent of 25% of the regular season. The student must also complete a student assistance program or similar approved educational program in order to be reinstated. Note, for first-time offenders in the area of knowingly in the presence of alcohol, illegal drugs, and or drug paraphernalia, the suspension will be for 12.5% of the regular season. The student must also complete a student assistance program or similar approved educational program in order to be reinstated. Also note, for second-time offenders in the area of knowingly in the presence of alcohol, illegal drugs, and or drug paraphernalia. And in this area, please note, in situations where it is noticeably apparent to law enforcement that alcohol, illegal drugs, and or drug paraphernalia are present, the district's determination will be that the student was knowingly in the presence of alcohol, illegal drugs, and or drug paraphernalia. So for a second time offense in this area, without any other first time offense, in items numbered 1 to 9 on pages 18 through 20 of the handbook, the suspension for a second time offense knowingly in the presence would be suspension for 40% of the regular season or the equivalent of 40%. The student must also complete a student assistance program or similar approved educational program in order to be reinstated. Again, those are for first violations. For second violations without a self-referral on 1 to 9 on pages 18 to 20, suspension for an entire season or the equivalent of an entire season. For third violations, suspension for one full school year or the equivalent of one full school year. And for fourth violations, the student loses the privilege to participate in all co-curricular activities during the remainder of his or her academic career in the district. Now I'm going to talk about penalties for code violations with a self-referral or an honesty referral. These are found on pages 21 through pages 25. We basically want to reward honesty where students either come forward and tell the truth without us knowing or tell us the truth upon questioning. Okay, Honesty is the best policy. If a student breaks the code of conduct, we strongly encourage them to do the right thing 
which is to turn themselves in immediately to the activities coordinator and or their coach. So let's define the self-referral on page 21. If a student presents himself or herself to the activities coordinator as a person who has violated the code of conduct in the areas numbered one to five below, okay, use possession of or selling, buying or selling of controlled substances, street drugs, illegal drugs, and or performance enhancing substances, drug paraphernalia, including sale, possession, or use, use, possession, or purchase of tobacco in any form, use, possession, or purchase of alcoholic beverages, knowingly in the presence of alcohol, illegal drugs, and or drug paraphernalia, and acts of vandalism. So in those five areas, okay, the self-referral policy, if the student presents himself or herself, that student will have his or her penalty reduced. For this to occur and to meet the self-referral criteria, the student must self-admit no later than the first school day after the violation has occurred and the information cannot already have been shared with school administration from another source. Administration may grant an extension to the one school day provision due to extenuating circumstances. Students and or parents are strongly encouraged to self-report violations of the Code of Conduct during the summer months to the activities coordinator as soon as possible. That's the definition of a self-referral. An honesty referral is defined as if a student upon first questioning by the activities coordinator or, other, or an other school administrator provides truthful information about committing a Code of Conduct violation in the areas number one to five below, which were previously mentioned in this video, that student will have his or her penalty reduced. For this to occur, the school must be conducting an investigation and not have had a law enforcement report and or published written account and or other factual credible means confirming the student had committed a code of conduct violation. So again, many times students upon questioning about something without maybe us having a written report fess up and say, yep, I broke the code. If that happens, we want to reward the student for being honest upon first questioning, and as such, we've adopted an honesty referral. So now let's define what the penalties are on page 23 for a self-referral, a first violation, suspension for 12.5% of the regular season or the equivalent of 12.5% of the regular season. The student must also complete a student assistance program or similar approved educational program in order to be reinstated. Note, for first-time offenders in the area of knowingly in the presence of alcohol, illegal drugs, and or drug paraphernalia, and in, this, in these situations where it is noticeably apparent to law enforcement that alcohol, illegal drugs, and or drug paraphernalia are present, the district's determination will be that the student was in fact knowingly in the presence of alcohol illegal drugs, and or drug paraphernalia. The suspension will be for 12.5% of the regular season. And should the student also volunteer to complete a student assistance program or similar approved educational program and the time frame permits such participation prior to the completion of a season, the penalty will be reduced to one competition or performance. Note, for second-time offenders in the areas of knowingly in the presence for students without any other first-time offenses referenced in numbers 1 to 9 on pages 21 and 22 of the Cole Curricular Handbook where a student is knowingly in the presence of alcohol, illegal drugs, and or drug paraphernalia suspension for 25 percent of the season or the equivalent of 25 percent. The student must also complete a student assistance program or similar approved educational program in order to be reinstated. Any student with a previous code of conduct violation in this area who meets the definition above for a second time offense will be eligible for this new language. A second time offense with the self referral for category A activities suspension for 50% of the season or the equivalent of 50% of the season with the following requirements. One, a 20 hour community service plan. The plan must be submitted to the activities coordinator within five school days. The community service hours must be completed prior to the activity eligibility being reinstated. 
and two, meeting with the high school social worker and or the district's ATODA coordinator and following through with any recommended course of action. The program must be successfully completed prior to the co-curricular eligibility being reinstated or prior arrangements must be made with the activities coordinator. For third violations with the self-referral, suspension will be for one full school year or the equivalent of one full school year. For fourth violations of a self-referral, the student loses the privilege to participate in all co-curricular activities during the remainder of his or her academic career in the district. On page 24, for penalties with an honesty referral, first violation. Suspension for 16.6% of the regular season or the equivalent of 16.6% of the regular season. The student must also complete a student assistance program or similar approved educational program in order to be reinstated. Note, for first-time offenders in the area of knowingly in the presence of alcohol, illegal drugs, and or drug paraphernalia, also in situations where it is noticeably apparent to law enforcement officials that alcohol, illegal drugs, and or drug paraphernalia are present, the district's determination will be that the student was knowingly in the presence of alcohol, illegal drugs, and or drug paraphernalia. That First-time offender suspension will be for 12.5% of the regular season or the equivalent of 12.5% of the regular season. Should the student also volunteer to complete a student assistance program or similar approved educational program and the time frame permits such participation prior to the completion of the season, the penalty will be reduced to two competitions or performance dates. Also note, for second-time offenders in the area of knowingly in the presence of alcohol, illegal drugs, and or drug paraphernalia, without any first-time offense in areas numbered 1 to 9, found on page 23 and 4 of the District's Co-Curricular Handbook. And again, this is in the knowingly in the presence of alcohol, illegal drugs, and or drug paraphernalia category. The suspension will be for 33.3% of the regular season, or the equivalent of 33.3% of the regular season. The student must also complete an educational program or a student assistance program in order to be reinstated. And also be aware, any student with a previous code of conduct violation in the knowingly in the presence area who meets the definition above for a second time offense will be eligible for this new language. With an honesty referral for second violations in Category A, suspension for 60% of a season, or the equivalent of 60% of the season with the following additional requirements. One, a 25-hour community service plan. The plan must be submitted to the activities coordinator within five school days of the violation, and the community service hours must be completed prior to athletic or activity eligibility being reinstated. And two, meeting with the high school social worker and or district's ATODA coordinator and following through with any recommended course of action. The program must be successfully completed prior to the co-curricular eligibility being reinstated or prior arrangements must be made with the activities coordinator. A third violation with an honesty referral, suspension will be for one full school year or the equivalent of one full school year. The fourth violation, the student loses the privilege to participate in all co-curricular activities during the remainder of his or her academic career. On pages 25 and 26, I want to talk about those items are offenses that are cumulative within themselves only and apply to all activity categories referenced in this handbook. Meaning a first violation here doesn't automatically result in a second violation in, a, in an alcohol category as an example if there's only been a first violation in alcohol. So, criminal offense or violation of a city county ordinance having a statutory counterpart. The significance of the violation will be evaluated and the suspension will be determined based on the severity of the offense. Please note, a WIA rule, any student charged and or convicted of a felony shall upon the filing of felony charges become ineligible for all further participation until the student has paid his or her debt to society and the courts consider the sentence served, including probation, community service, etc. So again, WA language about a felony. 
Also note the Oshkosh Area School District rule below, which could apply in addition to the WA rule regarding felonies, which is on the top of page 26. If a student is charged with a felony, the student could lose the right to participate in athletics or activities and or clubs for the remainder of their high school career in the district. We hope that this never happens to a student, but we want you to be aware of this language, um, both the WI rule and the Oshkosh Area School District rule regarding felonies. Also, in the criminal offense or city county ordinance category, if a student uses the self-referral and or honesty referral option outlined previously in this handbook, his or her suspension may be reduced depending on the severity of, of the offense for a first or second violation only, and it would exclude all felony charges. Number 11, which is new, physical violence or threatening violence against another individual, the school, another entity, or organization. The significance of the violation will be evaluated and the suspension will be determined based on the severity of the offense. However, the suspension will be for a minimum of 12.5% of the season. So if a student threatens another student's well-being, as an example, this could result in an automatic 12.5% season suspension if they're found in violation of number 11. Number 12, acts of harassment, including hazing. Please refer to the district's policy. The significance of the violation will be evaluated and the penalty, which may involve game suspensions, will be determined based on the severity of the offense. Remember, there is no place in the Wildcat Athletic Program for hazing activities, for harassment, or bullying. If you feel you're a victim of those things, please report it to a school administrator, a coach, or teacher immediately. I also want to reference number 15, illegal or inappropriate use of the internet and or electronic devices. Any posting or communication via social networking websites which disrupts either the education or athletic environment is unacceptable. This includes but is not limited to the consumption of alcohol or the use of illicit drugs or facsimiles, inappropriate sexually oriented material or activities involving bullying, hazing, or harassment. In that particular area, the severity of the offense will be taken into account and the appropriate suspension will be handed down accordingly. On pages 27 and 28 is information about behavioral offenses. Again, these are still violations of the district's co-curricular code of conduct, but are not necessarily as severe as some of the behaviors identified previously. Be aware of all of those items, number one through eight. I do want to reference a few. Number four, acts of truancy. A student participating in activities might not be permitted to participate in the next scheduled contest whenever the student is deemed truant as defined by school policy unless administration grants permission to participate. Students may continue to practice at the discretion of school administration after consultation with the coach or advisor. Number five, behavior or conduct which reflects unfavorably. The significance of the violation will be evaluated and suspension will be determined based on the severity of the offense. Number six, cheating. We understand mistakes are made. It's imperative that students communicate with their teachers to understand all rules and policies regarding the sharing of work or group projects and or citations of other, other, um, others' works in written papers so that a student does not get referred for cheating and or plagiarism. Realizing that mistakes happen the district has, has created the following policy. For a first offense, the teacher involved will handle the situation in the classroom and will make contact with the activities coordinator. Basically a warning. Second offense and any additional offenses, the student will be referred for a behavioral offense or code of conduct violation. The significance of the violation will be evaluated and suspension will be determined based on the severity of the offense. Note, however, for any first offense found to be especially serious, administration reserves the right to invoke a second offense consequence. Number eight, failure to be a student in good standing. 
A student must be a student in good standing at each check, each school year checkpoint in order to compete in any co-curricular event. A student in good standing is defined as follows on the page on page 27, number one. You adhere to your high school code of student conduct. On page 28, two, you adhere to your high school attendance and tardy policies. Three, you have no unserved detentions. Detention checkpoints for the 2021 school year include October 1st, the start of each winter sports season, January 11th, the start of each spring sports season, and April 12th. Only administrative approval will allow a student to compete in co-curricular events if a student is not a student in good standing. On page 28 is information about the WIA tournament series. The minimum penalty for code of conduct violations or any behavioral offenses that result in a student athlete being disqualified for any portion of a WIA tournament series competition is immediate disqualification of the student athlete for the remainder of the total tournament series in that sport. Again, we encourage you to make good choices, and if you don't, utilize our self-referral policy. Do the right thing, do the responsible thing, turn yourself in. However, make good choices. When you find yourself in a potential bad situation, leave immediately, get out of there. Remember, you have more to lose than students that are not involved in athletics or activities. Regarding the district's appeal process on page 29, the Oshkosh Area School District is committed to providing students an opportunity to appeal code, co-curricular code of conduct violation determinations. The appeal process is outlined on page 29 under number one, and then on page 30, number two, and number three. Realize on page 30, under number two, appeals may be filed only in reference to whether there was a code violation or not. An appeal may not be filed to change a consequence. Also note, the decision by the appeal committee will be final and binding, meaning the appeals committee will either A, uphold the suspension, or B, abolish it, meaning it never happened. On pages 30 to 32 is information about awards. There are two types of awards presented to athletes or students, participation awards and achievement awards. To qualify for an award, the athlete or student may not be suspended for any alcohol, tobacco, drugs, drug paraphernalia, performance enhancing substance, vandalism, criminal offense, or violation of a city county ordinance having a statutory counterpart or other serious offense considered unbecoming of a student athlete. If an athlete or student self-refers to the activities coordinator, again, self-refers for a first-time offense in the areas of alcohol, tobacco, drugs, drug paraphernalia, performance-enhancing substances, vandalism, and possibly criminal offense or violation of a city county ordinance having a statutory counterpart, the athlete or student may be eligible to receive any school awards earned during the season once all obligations concerning the referral have been fulfilled. Note, in bold on page 30 and continuing on 31 is a new application process for a student to be able to receive their school award. Also, if a student has not utilized the self-referral option and he or she wants to earn their school award, he or she may apply to earn their school award for a first offense in the areas referenced above or previously by utilizing the following process. One, the student submits written application to the activities coordinator indicating their desire to earn their school award and includes a 15-hour community service plan. Two, once the application is reviewed and approved by the activities coordinator, the student may begin serving their community service hours. Three, upon successful completion of all community service hours, that student will be provided with the school award they have earned that season. Again, this is a new policy we're putting in place to help students earn a school award even if they don't use a self-referral option because we understand we're all human, we make mistakes, and that school award may be a very important award for the students. So we're trying to help them earn that award, but it will require an application, community service, and follow through on their part in order to get that school award. 
Also, note the following Oshkosh Area School District All-Conference Guideline. Any OASD student athlete suspended from participation for an athletic contest due to a code of conduct violation in the area of alcohol, tobacco, drugs, drug paraphernalia, performance enhancing substances, vandalism, criminal offense, or violation of a city county ordinance having a statutory counterpart or other serious offense considered unbecoming of a student athlete will not be eligible for all conference recognition in any conference in the sport where the suspension is initiated. And keep in mind, if you're a very talented varsity athlete, if you're not eligible for all conference, you're not going to be eligible for all region and or all state. So again, hopefully another thing to think about when it comes to being in a situation where you could be found to be in violation of the district's co-curricular code of conduct. On pages 32 and 33 is information about communication. The activities department encourages students, parents, and coaches and advisors to open the lines of communication using the following understandings. 1 through 10, I'm going to highlight some specific areas. Number 1, coaches' advisors are required to operate under an open-door policy where they will candidly respond to questions and concerns from either the student or the parent. Four, coaches' advisors should schedule any meeting requested with the student and or parents in a private setting. Five, communication by all parties will be carried out in a calm, rational, mature discussion with respect shown to all. So please be aware of that communication policy. As, as student-athletes become young adults, we want them to work through their coaches to handle adversity and situations that come up. So if you have questions about your playing time, about your role on the team, the position you may be playing, don't complain about it. Schedule a time with your coach to talk about what's going on. They will provide you honest and objective feedback. If at the end you don't come to a resolution, maybe you'll have to agree to disagree. But please take the time if you have questions, schedule a meeting with your coach. On page 33 is information regarding sportsmanship. Please be sure to read that. I want to specifically mention some of the Fox Valley Association expectations of parents, guests, and other fans. Game attendance is a privilege. Be respectful of game officials, players, coaches, opposing fans, and facilities. And remember, most of all, be a fan, not a fanatic. On page 34 is information that, and some websites that would be very helpful to parents, the foxvalleyassociation.org website. On that website, you can find out all the information about all of the conference sports that the Fox Valley Association has for each one of our conference members. Um, on that website, you can find the schedules for specifically your child's sport that they participate in. You can see the schedule, download it, and print it. You can sign up under the Notify Me area to receive free text messages and or emails when there are changes to the schedule. Fox Valley FEASports.net is the FEA's website where we have all the scores, standings, and other features regarding the different sports our conference sponsors for each of our schools. And I strongly encourage you to follow me on Twitter as I like to highlight all the great things our students and student athletes are doing competing in their favorite activities. So you can follow me at Twitter at OWHS Activities. The next section of the co-curricular handbook is the appendix area and we're going to start with the 2020-2021 WIAA High School Eligibility Information Bulletin. It's imperative that you as a parent and student athlete read this section, review all the information found within it, as these are state association rules in order to be eligible. And if you ever have a question about anything at all, please ask as we are here to help. First of all, age. A student shall be ineligible for a competition if he or she reaches his or her 19th birthday before August 1st of any given school year. 
And again, I'm gonna highlight some of the areas that I think are important, but please be aware you're responsible for all sections here. Under determining residence, a full-time student, whether an adult or not, is eligible for varsity interscholastic competition only at the school within whose attendance boundaries his or her parents reside. I specifically want to mention letter C. In the event of a divorce or legal separation, whether pending or final, a student's residence at the beginning of the school year shall determine eligibility, except in situations involving transfer after the fourth consecutive semester following entry into grade nine. For the purpose of this rule, attendance at one day of school and or attendance at one athletic practice shall determine beginning of the school year. Under transfers, a full-time student may be afforded up to eight consecutive semesters of interscholastic eligibility upon entry into grade nine. Transferring schools at any time may result in restrictions being imposed on eligibility, or in some cases, a denial of eligibility. For the purpose of this rule, attendance at one day of school and or attendance at one athletic practice shall determine beginning of the school year. If you are a transfer student or if you are considering transferring, I strongly encourage you to talk to myself if you're already an Oshkosh West student before you um, transfer so that you are fully aware of how your eligibility may be impacted with a transfer. Letter A, a student who transfers from any school into a member school after the sixth consecutive semester following entry into grade nine shall be ineligible for competition at any level for one calendar year, but may practice unless the transfer is made necessary by a total and complete change in residence by parents. The calendar year will be determined from a student's first day of attendance at the new school. Keep in mind, a necessitated change in residence isn't necessarily automatic when one moves. The WIAA will have final say in some cases on whether or not your change in residence was necessitated. B, students entering ninth and or 10th grade at the beginning of the school year and who are within the first four consecutive semesters of high school will be afforded unrestricted eligibility provided all rules governing student eligibility are met. Students entering 11th grade are restricted to non-varsity opportunities for one calendar year. D, students entering 12th grade as transfer students are ineligible to compete at any level for one calendar year, but may practice. G, in the event of divorce or legal separation, whether pending or final, residents at the beginning of the school year shall determine eligibility for students entering 9th and or 10th grade. In situations involving transfer after the sixth consecutive semester following entry into grade nine, the student is ineligible to compete at any level for one calendar year, but may practice. And H, district policies with respect to intra-district transfer do not supersede WIA transfer rules in situations involving post-sixth semester transfers. Intra-district transfers occurring after the sixth consecutive semester following entry into grade nine result in the student being ineligible for competition at any level for one calendar year. We are a, a district, a multi-high school district, so our Oshkosh Area School District transfer rules do not supersede the WIAA's transfer rule. And letter M, no eligibility will be granted for a student whose residence within a school's attendance boundary with or without parents or whose attendance at a school has been the result of undue influence, so special consideration due to athletic ability or potential on the part of any person, whether or not connected with the school. Under training and conduct, please note a student athlete must follow his or her code of conduct or training rules on a year-round basis. Please note all of the areas found there, A through I, but I want to mention a couple in particular, C. Any student charged and or convicted of a felony shall upon filing a felony charges become ineligible for all further participation until the student has paid his or her debt to society and the courts consider the sentence served, including probation, community service, etc. Letter E, a student athlete who violates any part of a school or WA's code of conduct resulting in a suspension for any per portion 
of a WIA-sponsored tournament competition must be immediately declared ineligible for the remainder of the tournament series in that sport. During the WIA tournament, an ineligible athlete may not suit up. Letter F, a student athlete disqualified from a contest for flagrant or unsportsmanlike conduct is also suspended from the next competitive event at the same level of competition as the disqualification. Letter G, any player who in the judgment of the official intentionally spits on, strikes, slaps, kicks, pushes, or aggressively physically contacts an official at any time shall be immediately ineligible for competition a minimum of 90 calendar days from the date of the confrontation. In addition, the player is ineligible for the first 25% of the next season in that same sport, meaning never put yourself in a position where your emotions get the best of you and you are trying to have a conversation or discussion or disagreement with an official. You never want to put yourself in that position. Amateur status, probably one of the single most important sections of the eligibility bulletin. Please be aware of these areas and when in doubt, never take whatever is being provided, never let your name, likeness, or picture be used. A student athlete must be an amateur in all recognized sports of the association in order to compete in any WA sport. A, a student athlete may not accept, receive, or direct to another reimbursement in any form of salary, cash, or share of game or season proceeds for athletic accomplishments, such as being on a winning team, being selected for the school team, or being a place winner in an individual tournament. B, a student athlete may receive a medal, cup, trophy, or plaque from the sponsoring organization regardless of cost. School mementos valued not more than $200 an award valued not more than $100 retail for participation in an athletic contest in a WI recognized sport and may retain non-school competition apparel worn by the student as part of the team uniform. C. A student athlete may not receive compensation or benefit directly or indirectly for the use of name, picture, and or personal appearance as an athlete because of ability, potential, and or performance as an athlete. D, a student athlete may not receive free and or reduced rates on equipment, apparel, camps, clinics, instructions, and competitive opportunities that are not identical for any and all interested students. Meaning, if you go in to buy shoes and the store wants to give you a discount just because you're a high school athlete, you cannot take that discount if it's not available to any high school student or you'd be in violation of amateur status. Letter E, a student athlete may not be identified with or without permission as an athlete, provide endorsement as an athlete, or appear as an athlete in the promotion of a commercial, advertisement, and or profit-making event, item, plan, or service. Letter F, a student athlete may not participate in school athletics or in school activities outside the school under a name other, his, other than his or her own. So, when in doubt at any time regarding amateur status, don't take the item, don't let them use your name, picture, likeness, personal information. Sports activities outside of school. Athletes may compete in not more than two non-school competitions with prior, again, with prior school approval during each regular sports season. The contest will not count against the individual maximum for the athlete in the sport. Non-school competition will not be allowed during the respected WIA tournament series in a sport. Violations of this rule result in loss of eligibility for the remainder of the season and forfeiture of the two non-school opportunities. Note, this is competing in a non-school competition in the same sport during your high school season as determined by the school and WIA. So it has to be same sport during the high school season. Letter A. WA rules do not prevent athletes from practicing with non-school teams or from receiving private skill instruction during the school season. However, they may not participate fully or unofficially in more than two non-school competitions or races, including scrimmages against other teams, with prior school approval. One, this restriction applies to normal non-school games, as well as gimmicks, such as reduced number competitions, meaning 
three-on-three basketball, six-player soccer, or specific skill contests, punt, pass, and kick, shooting contests, free throws, three-point, etc., fun runs. Number two, during the season, athletes may participate in a skills contest with approval of the school. Specific skills contests isolate separate skills outside of the traditional competition setting. A skill contest may not include physical contact or extreme fatigue as the actual sport competition. Fun runs are not considered skills contests. There can be no school coach involvement. All other eligibility rules, including amateur status, apply. And three, a student who is a member of a school team during the previous year may not delay reporting for the school team beyond the school's official opening day of practice in order to continue non-school training and or competition. Letter C, a student athlete or his or her parents must pay 100% of the fee for, for specialized training or instruction such as camps, clinics, and similar programs. And E, a student athlete must not participate in an all-star game or similar contest. Any questions about all-star contests? please contact Mr. Jadarski in the activities office. On the bottom of the high school eligibility bulletin is a little thing that says parent athlete rules sign off form. You do not need to turn that in as you are signing off on the high school eligibility bulletin when you receive, or when you sign off on the agreement of parent and athlete form. The next section is the WIAA performance enhancing and banned substance list. Please note, banned substances are drugs that are illegal or could be harmful if taken in excess amount. Possession and or use does violate the WIA rules or code of conduct. Note, medications prescribed by a healthcare provider used by the individual, they have been prescribed to and used as prescribed, should not be viewed as violating the controlled substance supplemental provisions of the school code. Meaning, if your child has to take an item that is considered a banned substance and it is legally prescribed by a doctor that is not considered a violation, we ask that you just make us aware of that situation if at all possible. Discouraged substances, possession, and or use may violate school district policy or code. Please be aware of all of the discouraged items. Be aware of the permissible sub supplements. Okay? Again, be aware of this document. Know what's in it now, not when you're in a jam. The next appendix uh, is the Parent's Guardian's Guide to a Concussion. Again, a concussion is a brain injury. It is a serious thing. As a student athlete, you should never try to hide the fact that you may have a concussion. Okay, If, if, you, if our coaches have any doubt that you have a concussion, they are required to sit you out. Parents, know the signs and symptoms of a concussion. Your child may be fine at practice, but when they get home, they may not be correct. So know the signs and symptoms. Okay. Those that are typically have been observed by parents, trainers, friends, teachers, or coaches include being appears, appearing dazed or stunned, confused about what to do, forgets plays, is unsure of the game score or opponent, moves clumsily, answers questions slowly, Loses consciousness, shows behavior or personality changes, can't recall events prior to the hit or blow, can't recall events after the hit or blow. Symptoms reported many times by athletes, headache, nausea, balance problems or dizziness, double or fuzzy vision, sensitivity to light or noise, feeling sluggish, feeling foggy or groggy, concentration or memory problems, confusion. Okay, those are all signs, symptoms, and look for us. Again, this resource is a great tool for you as a parent to have regarding concussions. The next appendix section is in regards to hazing. It's information from the National Federation of High Schools. They define hazing as any humiliating or dangerous activity expected of a student to belong to a group regardless of their willingness to participate. Hazing, harassment, bullying, they are not tolerated at Oshkosh West. As I mentioned before, if you feel you have been the victim of hazing, harassment, or bullying. Please talk to your coach, talk to the activities coordinator, talk to a school administrator, report it immediately so we can look into it.
There's also an information, a positive sport parenting tool for parents and a positive sport parenting access, uh, assessment results that we encourage you to take. And the last pages of the handbook, as I mentioned before, include the Oshkosh West Wildcat Creed, which was developed by students of Oshkosh West and athletes in July of 2015, as well as the Oshkosh West Athletic Department vision and core values. If you're a student athlete who has aspirations to compete in college athletics beyond high school at the NCAA Division I or II level, you need to be aware of the NCAA Eligibility Center. Please work with your guidance counselor as they will make sure you're on the correct academic track to be eligible if you go to an NCAA Division I or II institution. They will also help you um, work through the process of registering with the Eligibility Center. As I mentioned before, if you are a transfer student, meaning you are brand new to the Oshkosh Area School District, it's imperative that you contact me to let me know that you are a transfer so that we can make sure you are cleared from an eligibility standpoint to begin to practice and or compete in athletics. And if you are a new student to the district, welcome to Oshkosh West High School. We look forward to having you be a member of the Wildcat family. As I mentioned before, there are going to be specific changes to the locker room this year um, in the fall and potentially in winter and spring. But be aware, Oshkosh West High School supplies locks for our student athletes to use in the locker room. It is expected they use the lock that's issued to them. And I can't emphasize this enough, student athletes, lock up your valuables at all times. And when your sports season is done, it is imperative that you clean out your locker. Even if you're going out for a sport the next season, you must clean out your locker so that we can get them cleaned and ready for the next season. And please, student athletes, it will be an expectation that you socially distance in the locker rooms this year. Do your part to keep yourself and your teammates safe and healthy. Parents, you need to be aware of the Oshkosh West Booster Club. They are a group that helps raise substantial amounts of funds to help provide purchasing power for our different athletic programs. They do different fundraisers during the year. One of their biggest fundraisers is the selling of concession stand items, which requires individuals to work those, those nights. We have the concession stand open. Realizing that we are in a COVID pandemic situation right now, all things may be different for this year. We may not be able to have concession stands. We may not be able to do normal fundraisers. So whatever we can do, it's imperative that every parent do their part to help the Booster Club raise whatever amount of funding we can. So if you get that call to help out in the stand or to assist with that fundraiser, please do your part to help the Oshkosh West Booster Club. Normal meeting times were the first Wednesday of each month at 6.30 in the O Room. However, for this school year, um, we're not sure if any meetings will be available or able to be held at any point in time this school year. So watch the school newsletter for more information or your email from your sport rep regarding more information or updates concerning the Oshkosh West Booster Club. So that will conclude our presentation of the 2020-21 school year OASD co-curricular handbook presentation. We know this is going to be a challenging year for students, parents, coaches, um, school officials. We ask that we all do our part to keep each and every student athlete safe, healthy, with our goal being to provide a, an opportunity for student athletes to have practices and competitions. We know how important it is for kids to be involved in activities during their high school time. If we all work together and we all do what is asked of us, I am hopeful and confident that we will be able to have seasons this year, have competitions, and make the most out of this difficult, challenging time for all of us. Thanks again. Enjoy the 2021 school year, and go Wildcats!